another episode of Cosmic Echo, a podcast that applies a scientific viewpoint on the strange and bizarre phenomenon that happen in our lives when we sleep and in altered states. In this episode, we speak with Steve Myers, who is and the author of Singing to the Plants and has a PhD uh, in religious studies and in psychology. Uh, Steve is a very knowledgeable individual about uh, shamanism. So without further ado, let's get to the interview. Today we are joined with Stephen Beyer, the author of the fantastic Singing to the Plants. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. That's a great pleasure to be here with you. So um, first off, one of the things that that I was really interested in in reading your book um, was the concept that you referenced James Hillman a lot. And um, could you talk a little bit about um, Hillman's um, concepts of soul-making and perhaps magical realism and how that relates to Amazonian shamanism? Oh, that's a good question to start off with. I think drinking ayahuasca and a whole bunch of related kinds of visionary experiences subvert our ordinary concepts of reality. First of all, I think that we can't think about ayahuasca and its hallucinogenic properties outside the context of other kinds of similar experiences such as lucid dreaming, hallucinations, uh, false awakenings, um, um, out-of-body experiences, Um, And all of these experiences, I think, are subversive of our European heritage of a, a, a dualistic ontology, a dualistic way of looking at reality. Um, we seem to think that we can take everything in the universe and put it into one of just two buckets. And one bucket is labeled real, and the other bucket is labeled not real. Um, But one of the things these experiences, um, I think, starts to teach us is that maybe there aren't just two buckets. (laughs) Maybe there are three buckets. And one of the things that is interesting about James Hillman and other people who have written on um, active imagination, the the Jungian process of of active imagination, is that they are pretty clear that there are three buckets, and one is named real, and one is named unreal, and the third one is named imaginal, which is different from just, you know, imagination, because the writers on active imagination, especially James Hillman, are very clear that the imaginal is its own order of reality. So one of the things I like about James Hillman is that he is subversive of dualistic ontologies, and he talks about three buckets. But then you ask yourself, why just three? (laughs) Why not 20? Um, Why have any buckets at all? And I think that the experiences you have with ayahuasca, as well as other kinds of experiences, but we'll talk about ayahuasca here, is that it tells you that right here, right now, present before you, are depths of meaning in reality that you were previously unaware of and that can affect your entire view of reality and your way of life. Um, I think that it's not that. A lot of people describe ayahuasca experiences probably because of the influence of of earlier writers on shamanism like Mercia Eliade. They describe ayahuasca as traveling to a different dimension or traveling to a different place. I'm not sure that's the best possible description of ayahuasca. I think what ayahuasca does is to show you things that are here all the time 
and you just don't see them. I asked a, a, a shaman in the upper Amazon whether he could see the spirits all the time. And he gave a wonderful answer. He said, yes, I see them all the time, but vaguely. <laughs> Ayahuasca, he said, is like putting on glasses. And I think that's true. I think what Ayahuasca teaches is that right here, right now, the room that you are sitting in or I am sitting in, is covered with beautiful, um, intricate tiles in brilliant colors, that the spirits are here around us right now, that the plants are singing to us right now, but we just don't hear them. Wow. And so that's why I like James Hillman. Of, of all of the psychologists that I have read, he is most explicit in challenging um, dualistic European ontologies, and he is most explicit in, in talking about um, present, um, deeper realms of meaning in our current experiences. Um, let me give you an example. See, you wound me up with that question. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I was, I was curious. <laughs> um, let me give you an example. Let's say that you dream that you're walking along the street and you trip over a rock. And after you trip, you look up and there's a child smiling at you holding a flower. And you wake up from that dream and you say, wow, that was interesting. I wonder what that means. And you start trying to understand what that dream means. And there are all kinds of techniques you can use to try to understand what that dream means. You might, for example, go back into the dream. And you might ask the rock, why did I trip over you? Uh, what do you want? Um, what will you teach me? Will you be my teacher? You might go back into the dream and speak to the child and say, why did you smile? What do you want to teach me? You might go back into the dream and become the flower that the child is holding and say, who am I? What am I doing here? What is my attitude toward buyer, the dreamer? And what is it that I want to teach him? Um, you could do that by calling the rock or the flower or the child in front of you in a vision and speak to them and ask them to be your teacher. All of those things are things that you can do in a dream. But now let's suppose that you're walking down the street and you trip over a rock and you look up and there's a child smiling at you holding a flower. What do you do? You say, oh, crap. <laughs> I tripped over a rock. Right. My toe hurts. And we don't stop and ask what it means because we do not give reality the respect that we give to dreams. And yet there's absolutely no reason why reality cannot be our teacher just as much as a dream can be our teacher or a vision can be our teacher or the intelligent autonomous entities we meet in an ayahuasca vision or in active imagination can be our teachers. And once you start thinking along those lines, when you trip over a rock, you can say to the rock, what do you want to teach me? What do you want from me? Is there a gift I can give you so that you will give me a gift in return? Will you give me a song? Will you give me a dream? But we don't do that because we don't pay reality the same respect that we pay to dreams, and we, we divide them up. But if ayahuasca is right, if the spirits are here right now, if the plants are singing to us right now, right this minute, if my room is covered with intricate tessellations of brilliant colors, and I can look through the walls and see brilliant shining waters. Um, 
if all of that is the case, then everything is meaningful. And human experience is filled with depth and meaning. And I think that James Hillman is, is a psychologist who, who, has, um, who has taught us something about that. And he calls this soul-making. Wow. Well, that was, <laughs> no, that was, that was a long lecture. I apologize. No, that was great, and and it fits also kind of in with your your um, your pink neon buffalo um, mm-hmm. phrase as well, right? Of of um, of people wanting to see the pink neon buffalo and not being able to to see the lessons that are right in front of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's right. In terms of, of reciprocity with spirits, um, I heard you on a on another podcast. Um, I had the same question that another interviewer had, which was, um, what are some of the things that the spirits want? And I suppose it depends on what spirit you're, you're talking to, but I mean, what can, what can we do for the spirits? What, what, you know, what can they get Um, out of these relationships? I think I know what the spirits want. (laughs) (laughs) Um, of course, what the spirits want from me may be different from what they want from other people, but, um, I think the spirits like certain things. Um, I know they like tobacco. Okay. And one of the reasons they tolerate us, I think, is because we, we are the only species that, that can give them tobacco. But we can put that to one side. Um, they like our music. They love to hear us sing songs and play musical instruments. Um, I think that's why one of the gifts that you get from the spirits in, in many traditional cultures is a song. Um, certainly in the upper Amazon, one of the things that you get from the spirits when you're undergoing la dieta, the diet in the wilderness, is songs, all kinds of songs. Um, so they like our music. Um, but most important, I think they want us to be human beings again. I think they, they would like us to be as we once were, or at least the way the spirits think about our capacity to be what we once were, to, to live in relationships of mutuality, generosity, trust, uh, reciprocity with each other, um, to to be in right relationship with each other, uh, with the plants and the animals and with the spirits, with the rocks and the trees and the stars and thunder, and to be in a an open-hearted relationship with the spirits and with, with all of the other other than human persons that that populate our cosmos. I think that's what the spirits want from us. Okay. Um, all right, all right, all right, here's, a, here's a weird question for you, perhaps. Um, <laughs> sure. Does, does, um, okay. With an eye towards um, sustainability and with the distinct possibility of... Um, a future where energy resources are in decline. Um, Do you think, I mean, how do I say this? Should one learn to work um, with ayahuasca or should one specifically try to work with plants within one's own habitat or does ayahuasca want to glow global? Um, I don't know what ayahuasca wants. Um, Ayahuasca hasn't told me. Uh, I think... There is a lot of interest in ayahuasca now. Uh, Ayahuasca has entered into popular North American culture. Just last week, there was an article about ayahuasca in Skateboarder magazine. Wow, wow. Um, They have had ayahuasca in episodes of Nick Tuck. They have had ayahuasca in episodes of Weeds. There was an article in The Atlantic on ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is really penetrating in very 
interesting ways into North American culture. And we've seen this before. Uh, we forget that North Americans have very, very short attention spans. And I remember when, I, when LSD was going to change the world. Sure. And everybody would take LSD and we'd all have flowers in our hair and there would be no <laughs> more war. And that didn't happen. I can go back further. I remember in the 50s when uh, Zen Buddhism was going to take over and uh, was, was going to make peace and happiness occur everywhere. I remember in the 70s when there was a brief moment when Tibetan Buddhism was going to come and make everyone wear flowers in their hair or whatever. Americans have very short attention spans. And every time something new comes that is considered to be edgy and transgressive, it becomes very, very popular for a very short period of time. So I am not persuaded that ayahuasca is going to have anything more than a very short-lived presence in North American consciousness. Okay. And if, it, if I'm wrong, I will find out. One of the great advantages of predicting the future <laughs> is that you find out whether you're right or wrong. <laughs> Already, ayahuasca is is starting to be edged out a little bit by Iboga and Ibogaine. I think that as ayahuasca enters the American mainstream as a trope for the the edgy, transgressive hallucinogen of the month, it will become less interesting and something more exotic like like African Iboga is, is going to occupy American consciousness for a while. Now, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and we'll find out. But it seems to me that every time, especially a, a uh, hallucinogen or a psychoactive substance or a form of meditation or some kind of mind-altering process has entered into American consciousness, it has passed away relatively quickly and has not left a lasting mark on on North American uh, culture, which is voracious <laughs> in its appetite for novelty. Do you, speaking of of, um, of Buddhism, I mean, do you see any correspondences, or have you seen any um, similarities between particular, maybe even esoteric Buddhist practices and uh, shamanism along the Upper Amazon? Remember, I, I, I mentioned a whole bunch of, of what I have come to call visionary experiences as having many features in, in common. We, we talked uh, a little bit about the kinds of experiences that I think are very similar in, in important ways to ayahuasca experiences, and I've started to call these visionary experiences and uh, these include things not only like ayahuasca experiences, but hallucinations, lucid dreams, DMT journeys, out-of-body experiences, false awakenings, apparitions, and active imagination, the Jungian process that we talked about a little bit earlier in relationship to James Hillman. And I think that these visionary experiences have a lot of things in common. When you have one of these experiences, a, a DMT hallucination or an ayahuasca experience or a lucid dream or an out-of-body experience, what you are experiencing seems to be a, a present perception of an external reality. It seems real. It's present um, in a very perceptually forceful way. Let me, let me take a step back, and I'll tell you another story, if that's okay. Absolutely. Westerners are often very 
upset that they don't have great visionary experiences the first time they drink ayahuasca, just as people who go on vision quests are often very upset that they don't see the pink neon buffalo coming over the horizon. But it, it can and, and usually does take a number of sessions of drinking ayahuasca before anything really happens other than being really, really sick. And I had, I had been drinking ayahuasca with uh, uh, a shaman named Don Antonio Barrera, and nothing much had been happening. And I was just really sick and miserable, and I was sitting with my head down. And suddenly I felt somebody rubbing my head. And I thought to myself, oh, isn't that nice? Don Antonio has gotten up and he sees how sick and miserable I am. He's he's rubbing my head. And isn't that nice of him? And I look up and standing in front of me is this beautiful teenaged Amazonian girl. She must have been about 16 years old. And she had the, the really long, straight, dark, shiny hair and wearing a a t-shirt and blue shorts and she had the most wonderful smile that I have ever seen and she was standing there in a pool of light and since it was the middle of the night and it was dark I didn't think about where that light was coming from but there she was lit up in front of me with this absolutely fabulous smile and looking down at me where I was sitting there and I I sort of I just basked in her smile for a while and then she was gone but while she was there she was real she was she was present she was three-dimensional she was I was later told ayahuasca but while she was there, she was this beautiful, real um, Amazonian girl, really beautiful. And she was so pre- – you know how when it's dark, you generally don't walk right into a wall? Sure. Because you can feel a slight difference in air pressure as you get near something solid? Mm-hmm. That's what it felt like with her. There was that difference in air pressure that that you get with with a real thing so one of the features of visionary experiences is this kind of real presence of external objects i used to drink with um, don romulo mahin and he had this cleared space in front of his his hut in the jungle and one of the ways I knew that the ayahuasca was taking hold was that there were suddenly cast iron lawn chairs and tables all around in this open <laughs> clearing space. And they, were, and they were real in the same way this girl was real. So, so people and objects um, are, are, have the... Um, the force of a real external reality. They have the same quantity and quality of sensory detail as ordinary experiences. They're experienced as being external to you. They're out there. Um, there's, no, there's no sense that they are internal. They, they are out there. And they occur in what seems to you to be an extended three-dimensional explorable perceptual space you can get up and walk around in it (laughs) you you can and then what many of these have in common is that they frequently involve interactions with apparently autonomous others other than human persons spirits to uh, uh, the artist Elvis Luna, a, uh, an Amazonian artist, they can appear. They can be angels. To um, 
Pablo Amaringo. They are frequently pictured as visitors from other galaxies as well as spirits. But there are apparently autonomous other than human persons with whom you can interact. And you find this in uh, active imagination. And Jung and, and uh, Hillman and, and others who deal with active imagination make, make a lot out of the presence of these autonomous others that you meet. In lucid dreaming, people frequently meet other than human persons uh, that they interact with. Okay. What is interesting to me is that among all of these experiences, all of these visionary experiences, we can include the kind of visualization that you do in Tibetan meditation. Hmm. As you know, Tibetan meditation, if you're doing the usual kind of, of tantric meditation that, that uh, uh, you do in ritual meditation, is the construction of a minutely detailed image of the deity that you're visualizing, all of the ancillary deities, and ultimately, when you are really skilled, the entire mandala within which this deity lives, and with which you then join, and you visualize yourself in the form of the deity whose meditative exercise you are doing. It seems to me that there are significant similarities between um, this kind of Tibetan eidetic visualization and visionary experiences. So when you ask about Buddhist meditation, the one that occurs to me almost immediately is Tibetan eidetic visualization, the visualization of the deity as part of Tibetan ritual meditation, whether you're visualizing the deity in front of you or you are visualizing yourself as the deity. It has exactly the same features as a, a visionary experience of the kind I've been talking about. Well, thank you. Hey, um, Instigator1, did you have a question you wanted to get in there? Yeah, I had a question. Um, in the last couple, or the last page, I guess, of your book, it mentions that the, the shamans have a lot of patience um, especially from the West that are coming over um, to use their plants, but they're they're having a lock a lack of apprentice. I guess I think that's right. Yeah, and um, I guess my question is is you know a lot of people don't have thousands of dollars to to fly to Peru, and I'm you know I was looking online recently and seeing how expensive uh, some of those um, sessions can be now since the uh, since it's become, you know, a widespread um, thing through the West, um, how can Western people learn to be, you know, a possible shaman and help people heal in the West when, uh, you know, they're not able to actually be apprentice ship over there? How do people learn how to heal? There, there are more ways to heal than simply being a shaman. And I guess if somebody says to himself or herself, boy, I want to be a shaman, the question is, why does that person want to be a shaman? Now, I, I really have very little to say about this because I'm not a shaman. I have met real shamans, and I, I, I perhaps put one toe over the beginning <laughs> Uh, the path that, that they have spent decades and decades of their lives following. So the question I think is not so much do I want to be a shaman, but what do I want to do with my life? And if what you want to be is a healer, then there are all kinds of ways you can heal without being a shaman. If you want to hand out soup in a soup kitchen to homeless people with schizophrenia, then you're being a healer. 
if you want to help by teaching reading skills to high school dropouts, you're being a healer. If you want to sit in circle with community members in a dysfunctional community and try to come up with ways in which they can handle gang youth crime in their neighborhood without sending young men out of the community simply to rot in jail, then you're being a healer. So if your goal is to be a healer, you don't have to go to Peru. You can visit this all kinds of ways to heal right here, right now, without even going to medical school. <laughs> so the question then is, why do you want to be a shaman in particular? And I think that when you start trying to think through the extent to which you're looking for a label for yourself, or the extent to which you want to, um, you know, dress up in shaman clothes and, and impress people. Or there is a particular kind of shamanic healing that is calling you more than any other kind of healing. You have to work this out for yourself. And I think that if you are truly, truly called to be a shaman, if the spirits want you to be a shaman, they will open the door for you. But you have to be alert, and you have to be attentive, and you have to be aware of when the spirits are opening a door and when your ego is opening a door. Because if you think that it's the spirits opening a door, and it's really your ego that's opening that door, I will bet you that on the other side of that ego door are the spirits with a two-by-four. <laughs> <laughs> At websites such as um, ayahuasca.com, um, new and innovative methods for kind of almost creating a purge-free ayahuasca um, are being developed. So, I think one of the um, one of the more popular ones would be uh, the egg finding technique. So that takes the tannins out of um, out of the cappy and and definitely seriously reduces the nausea. Um, however. Is is that going about it the wrong way? I mean, um, are individuals who are, are taking the tannins out of ayahuasca and lessening the purging experience? I mean, is is that is that messing the whole thing up? Is purging vital to to the ayahuasca experience? Ayahuasca makes you vomit, and depending on the circumstances, including you know how strong it is and what the different proportion of beta carbolines might be in a particular drink. Um, the purging can be anywhere from uncomfortable to excruciating. And not only does it make you vomit, it gives you diarrhea. And people have more or less diarrhea. It is an emetic and it is a purgative. It's an emetic because it makes you throw up. It's a purgative because it gives you diarrhea. In its cultural context in the upper Amazon, uh, the emetic and purgative effects are considered to be very important and are part of the, the process by which ayahuasca is supposed, to, is supposed to produce its effects. As a matter of fact, in the upper Amazon, vomiting is much more common and much more socially acceptable than it is here. As a matter of fact, Parents in the upper Amazon uh, routinely give their children various kinds of emetics to make them vomit in order to, to get rid of uh, intestinal parasites. Whether that works or not, I don't know, but there are all kinds of medicines in the upper Amazon that people take routinely in order to vomit. So vomiting does not have the social stigma that it has in, say, North America, where vomiting is considered to be shameful and humiliating, and you go in the bathroom and you lock the door, and if somebody <laughs> knocks on the door, you say, go away, go away, leave me alone. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that happens is that Westerners who go down to the Amazon and drink ayahuasca resist vomiting. And so you get these horrid 
retching sounds as people try to kind of strangle the vomit from from coming out. And um, I will admit that that I have been that way myself because I went in there and considered uh, vomiting to be shameful. And I sometimes I would be making tape recordings of uh, the shamans singing, and in the background you hear these awful, awful noises, <laughs> and that's me. <laughs> <laughs> but as a matter of fact, when you're sitting in ceremony with indigenous or mestizo people, they vomit, but they, they, they just vomit. There, there's not all this social stigma and, and attempts at not vomiting involved. They just vomit. For many people, the vomiting, the emetic and purgative effects of ayahuasca are the primary thing they want from the medicine. And any visions they get are considered secondary because they take the medicine in order to to vomit so in that cultural context vomiting is very important my plant teacher Donia Maria would get very upset if somebody wasn't vomiting and she had a a special ceremony she she would do she had Olympia cleansing bath and special songs she would sing to open people up so they could vomit because not vomiting was considered a kind of blockage and was preventing the ayahuasca from doing what it's supposed to do. So if you look at it in its cultural context, vomit is, is important. It is, it is considered to be a positive thing to do. It's considered a healthy thing to do. It's considered to be cleansing and it's considered to be part of what the medicine is supposed to be, is supposed to be doing for you. People in North America who don't want to vomit have all kinds of opportunities for visionary experiences without vomiting, including, you know, intravenous administration of dimethyltryptamine, smokable dimethyltryptamine. There are all kinds of ways to, to uh, uh, experience visionary states without vomiting, including, you know, as we talked about before, Tibetan meditation. And I am absolutely not in a position to tell anybody whether it's important to them to vomit or not. That's between them and the spirits and where they are and where the spirits want them to be. And it may be that for a particular person, having a visionary experience without vomiting is, is important because the spirits take people where they are. And maybe this this is the way they need to go. Can I tell you another story? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I was I was hiking with a bunch of people through the Manu Biosphere Preserve down by Boca de Manu, and we had been hiking through the jungle for for several days, and we were dirty and smelly and miserable and bug bitten. And we were sitting around feeling very proud of ourselves because we were so dirty and miserable and bug bitten. And we were talking about people who would come down to the Amazon and go up and down the Amazon in these glass enclosed air conditioned boats. And we felt ourselves to be quite superior to those people because we were experiencing the real jungle and we were miserable and hot and sweaty and dirty and bug bitten and this is the real experience and these other people were in their glass enclosed boat drinking beer and not having the real experience but as i thought about that it occurred to me that that people move forward from where they are they don't move forward from where you think they ought to be and it may be that somebody on that glass enclosed air conditioned boat might think, hmm, maybe I should get out into that jungle a little bit and experience it a little differently than I'm experiencing now and might come back and might try going for a hike in the jungle. Or the person on the mo boat might decide that, that he or she has seen enough of the jungle but has a cousin who's a, a congressman and when this person tells the congressman about the experience, the congressman may be more inclined to do something to save the rainforest. 
you never know where people are going to go, but they have to go there from where they are now. And therefore, I am never, absolutely never in a position to tell people what their spiritual path ought to be. Just as I was not really, apart from ego, in a position to tell the people in the glass-enclosed air-conditioned boat that they were doing, doing it wrong. They weren't seeing the real jungle. And so I can't prescribe whether somebody else ought to be vomiting or not. For me personally, my interest has, has always been in states of consciousness in, in the context of indigenous ceremonial practices. That's what I'm interested in. But that doesn't mean anybody else should be interested in that. So I am no, and I am no more able to prescribe for other people what their experiences ought to be or to say that one experience is better than another or more authentic or higher or lower than any other experience. Once again, you just have to engage in, a, in an honest dialogue with the spirits and be honest about what it is you want. And if you're looking for a quick and easy, undemanding kind of experience, because that's where you are, then if the spirits, spirits think that's what you need, that's what they'll give you. And who knows where you will go from there. Thank you very much. Uh, Instigator One, you, you had uh, something you wanted to ask? Yeah, I had a couple questions, but um, I liked how you commented about that. And um, I noticed in your book you were talking about how um, – ayahuasca you think was found because there's commonly a question about how the people in the Amazon actually put these two plants together to make ayahuasca and uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and what your I think it was a theory about how they found that was I think there have been a lot of theories about how they came up with the combination of the uh, the ayahuasca vine and the the various plants that contain dimethyltryptamine in the jungle environment. And if you ask many of the shamans, they'll say, oh, the plants taught us. If you ask other people, they will, they will invoke some kind of a mystical, indigenous understanding of, of jungle plants. And I'm not in a position to, to say either of those is incorrect, but I thought, what would happen if we just eliminated those explanations and sought for an explanation that did not require plants teaching specific formulas and did not require the assumption that indigenous people somehow have a, um, a special kind of insight into jungle plants that, that anybody else might not have and it seems to me and and bear in mind that indigenous people all over the world are experts in their environment and they have found all kinds of plant combinations that have healing effects or have or have utilized plants for healing in all kinds of different ways that doesn't require any kind of uh, mystical understanding of nature, but simply shows that they are, like everybody else, intelligent, inquisitive, and creative inhabitants of their environment. And if we simply assume that indigenous people who came up with this combination uh, are intelligent and inquisitive uh, and creative, where may, might they have gotten this from? In my hypothesis, which I have no way of proving, is that maybe they were looking for a better way to vomit because uh, certainly the ayahuasca vine by itself can make you vomit. And certainly there are plants that are closely related to um, chacruna. There are other species of the Psychotria genus that have emetic properties. And so it may be that they... they combined various plants looking either for a way to enhance the emetic effects of the ayahuasca vine or to modulate the emetic effects of the ayahuasca vine and they came upon this combination which not only had 
whatever meta effects they might be looking for, but also gave uh, visionary experiences. So that's a hypothesis. I don't know how I would prove it or disprove it. And I, I don't want to. I don't want to be understood as somehow uh, putting down indigenous people because it's that is certainly not even my intention. I don't think it's what I'm saying. I'm saying that human beings everywhere are amazingly creative. And one of the reasons why human beings have become so expert in their own environments is because they experiment, they try things out, they use scientific reasoning processes in order to understand their, their own environment, and they do this over a long period of time. And I don't think it takes anything away from uh, the intelligence or the creativity or the curiosity of indigenous people to say that, that they learn these things the way everybody else learns them, by trying new things, seeing how they work, and uh, adopting things that work, and eliminating things that don't work. And in, in speaking about um, the indigenous people of the Amazon, I'm so sorry that we didn't get around earlier um, to Dona Maria and Don Roberto. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your teachers? Ah, uh, I love Doña Maria. It was it was such a shame that she died. She was such a wonderful woman, and one of the one of the greatest compliments that I got paid about uh, singing to the plants was when somebody said to me that the book really brought Doña Maria alive. That it really communicated something of her of her personality and her spirit. She was she was an absolutely wonderful woman. She, um, taking a walk in the jungle with her was like walking with an encyclopedia. She knew every plant, and we would walk down the, uh, a path in the jungle, and she would say, now here is this plant, and this is its name, and this is what you use it for, and this is how it's prepared, and uh, she would just go from one plant to another, and she knew them all personally. Like she, like we were at this big cocktail party, and she was introducing <laughs> me to all of her friends. And then, you know, I would try to keep up with her, and I would try to remember, and I would try to identify the different plants, and I wouldn't be able to do it because, because I, you know, I was a blockhead. And and she would scold me, and she would say, you know, we have all this medicine here, and you have to learn this. <laughs> She was, she was wonderful. She was the kind of, of woman, if she was sitting in a room with a bunch of other people and a child walked into the room, the child would automatically go stand by her. And she was fussy, and she would scold you, and, and she... Uh, um, and then she would, then she would be funny. She was warm. She was open. She, I, she was wonderful. And if this book can be something of a memorial to her, then that, um, that would be wonderful. Um, she and she had this really interesting history. She had begun as an oracionista, as a as a prayer healer. And she started having visions of the um, the Virgin Mary when she was seven years old, and the Virgin Mary would appear to her in dreams and teach her the the plants and what they they uh, would heal. And she would have dreams where angels would appear to her in dreams and tell her where there was a sick child, and she would then go to that child's house and offer to help the the child with her plant medicines. And this is when she was, you know, um, in school. This is when she was, you know, uh, 7, 12 years old. Wow. Wonderful woman. And she only became an ayahuascara when she was in her mid-20s, when she was attacked by a, uh, uh, a jealous sorcerer who filled her chest with darts. And she went and uh, she was suffering and uh, she was. She could find nobody who could help her, and one of her friends said, "Why don't you go see Don Roberto, who lived in the same town they lived in?" And she uh, went to see Don Roberto and knocked on the door, and he opened the door and he said, "Welcome, sister. I've been waiting for you." <laughs> 
And so she became Don Roberto's apprentice for a number of years and continued to work with him off and on uh, for the rest of her life. There were a lot more elements of folk Catholicism in her practice. There were, there were differences in the kinds of songs she sang. Even though she was an ayahuasquera, she brought her, her background into her ayahuasca practice. And I think apart from the fact that she, she as an individual, was, was fascinating, it shows, I think, the diversity of shamanic practice in the upper Amazon. There's no one way it's done. And she's an example of the kind of eclectic and syncretic currents that move in upper Amazonian shamanism. Don Roberto was much closer, I think, in his practice to indigenous upper Amazonian practice. They were both mestizos. And uh, much of what he did was, was less eclectic and syncretic and innovative than the practice that Doña Maria had. He was, how can I describe this? Um, he was, um, Doña Maria was, was very willing to talk to you. Don, uh, Don Roberto was much, much quieter, a much more internal kind of person. It took a long time for him to, to teach me many of the things that he eventually taught me. Okay. A much more reserved person than Doña Maria was. Although I consider him to be my maestro ayahuasquero, and I consider Doña Maria to be my plant teacher. <laughs> well, she so, sounded absolutely, both of them sounded absolutely amazing. Um, and I do believe that your book really does do them justice. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. I guess a question that I have um, after reading your book and other books is, um, you know, what about the experiences that are in your head that um, you have from uh, an ayahuasca session, you know, is it all spirits? Is it all in your head or is it something else? And I just wanted to hear your opinion on that. Obviously, you know, you have views of the, there's spirits out there. And But what about um, experiences in your own psyche and things like that? Can you give me an example of what you're talking about? Um, well, let me better understand. Say you're you're having a conversation with somebody in or a spirit in your um, in your experience, um, you know how do you determine the difference between it being a spirit and being like an aspect of your own consciousness? Um, in other words, are you just making it up? Exactly. Are those your only two choices? Um, well, <laughs> I mean, there's a combination of the two. There's, I, I just want to hear your own voice about it. You know, like um, what you think is really taking place or in other words which which of the two buckets does it belong in well not just the two just <laughs> just anything really i am not sure that that is a viable dichotomy for understanding these kinds of visionary experiences and i think it's very easy to get caught up in questions of is it is it really real is it all in my head because the spirits talk to you in all kinds of ways if you dream you trip over a rock and the rock is a spirit that's teaching you something or is calling your attention to something or wants to be your teacher, wants to give you a song, and then you trip over a rock when you're not dreaming and you wonder if the rock is a spirit that is telling you something or teaching you something or wants to give you a gift, I'm not sure that there's a lot of difference there because I think what's important is not ontological categories so much as depth and meaning and that our attention might be better focused on what we can learn from experiences in order to make ourselves better human beings because it may be that all of these experiences are coming from the spirits and their goal to make us better humans more like we were back in the mythical times when humans and animals spoke the same language so I'm not sure that, that the most valuable use of, of, of our energy is in, in trying to decide what's inside and what's outside, but uh, a, more, um, a better use might be to try and figure out what these experiences are trying to teach us. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great way of putting it. Uh, can you speak anything on the topic of um, ayahuasca and spirit possession of a human body? 
people in the upper Amazon believe that uh, spirit possession occurs, and uh, among the mestizos, they use the Spanish word uh, transcorporacion, which is also, interestingly enough, the uh, Spanish word that is used to translate the idea of reincarnation. Hmm. The way it works is that a shaman who is very experienced, a banco ayahuasquero, a shaman of the highest rank, will leave his body during an ayahuasca session, and the body will then be occupied. He will make room in his body for a, um, a great shaman of the past who will then conduct the healing ceremony while the shaman travels through the universe to distant galaxies and great spiritual hospitals and meets together in, in seminars of great shamans on distant planets. And in some indigenous traditions, uh, the shaman, in fact, remains in the body while the other shaman occupies the spirit of the other shaman. And they, in fact, engage in dialogue hmm. with each other. So, yes, shamans can be possessed by the spirits of great, powerful deceased shamans. They can also channel the voices of the dead, hmm. where, for example, someone has gone out fishing in his boat and has never returned, and anxious relatives seek out a shaman of this rank, who then goes under his mosquito net and channels the voice of this person who says, don't worry about me, I am in the land of the mermaids, and I am healthy and happy, and I will live here forever with these beautiful women. So, yes, there's a lot of that going on, and it's found in, in many upper Amazonian indigenous traditions, and the mestizo shamans have taken over this notion of speaking with the voices of the dead or being possessed by the spirits of powerful deceased shamans while they go traveling through the galaxy. So, you know, I just want to say that, you know, like, pretty much we've been trying to figure out this whole thing ourselves, and we've always had questions, and, you know, and we go around in circles pretty much with their answers to our questions about, you know, like the question I asked about if it'd be in your head or not and stuff like that. And, your view has really, I think, helped probably Richard, and it's definitely helped me to look at it in a different way to say, you know, we're asking the wrong questions. You know, we should just accept the experience of what it is, learn from it, rather than trying to figure out the answers to the universe, you know. so. Well, uh, nothing wrong with figuring out the answers to the universe. <laughs> yeah. um, although it has not been figured out, isn't it, 47? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's right. Of course. <laughs> Um, so I think, I think we are taught, we, we go to school, we go to, we go to college, we're, we're taught to be very abstract and there's nothing wrong with that. Abstract thinking has accomplished a lot of really good stuff, but it might be, at least it seems to me that for some of these questions, trying to interpret it in terms of, you know, metaphysical categories or, you know, levels of reality or whatever is less important than trying to understand what something means. Now, I don't mean that those kinds of things are unimportant, and we should all be thinking about, you know, what is the difference, if any, between dreams and reality and hallucinations? Those are all good things to think about. But part of what is important, I think, is when you're having these experiences to understand uh, what we're being taught. Um, in terms of how, how does this experience make me a, a better human being? How does this teach me how to be in right relationship with the other than human persons as well as the human persons uh, who surround me? Because I think that's what the spirits are trying to do. I think they're trying to teach us how to be human beings again. Um, how we can go back to that mythic first time when humans and animals spoke the, the same language. You have been listening to Steve Beyer, author of the book Singing to the Plants, A Guide to Mestizo Shamanism in the Upper Amazon, published by University of New Mexico Press. The book can be purchased through online resellers such as Amazon.com, 
and is an absolutely fantastic resource. If you or someone you know is interested in ayahuasca or Amazonian shamanism, we would recommend this title without any hesitation. If you enjoyed this episode of Cosmic Echo and would like to hear the next episode of Part 2, the interview with Steve Byer, please visit our podcast at www.tailleaders.com backslash CE podcast and learn more about also supporting this podcast through our patron page. We look forward to sharing additional podcast episodes in the near future.